I would say, you know, don't be afraid to put yourself outside of your comfort zone. Because typically, when you do that, you open up optionality. This is the Indian Nest Podcast, stories of success from leaders and change makers of Indian origin. Why have Indians achieved success across so many different disciplines around the globe? I have no idea, but let's find out together, because every story is unique. I am very excited to have Sonali Parikh with us today. She's the Chief Financial Officer for Ring Central, a large software company. She has been in leadership roles at Hewlett Packard, besides serving on several boards, and also has an over 20-year career on Wall Street. I invited her on this show as I was fascinated by her very unconventional career journey. Welcome, Sonali. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on our podcast. Thank you, Sandra. I am delighted to be here. Wonderful. Sonali, as um, we discussed before, this is really about your journey and the purpose is uh, for it to be there for posterity, but also to inspire, to motivate others who want to follow uh, in your journey. But to really find out about your journey, we really have to go to the beginning. So, which means you really have to tell us where were you born, tell us about your parents, and uh, maybe if there were grandparents, and then we'll get into other details around that. Absolutely. Sounds like a very sensible place to start. Um, mm -hmm. So if we go back to the very beginning. I was born in Montreal, Canada. And um, which is where I was born and raised. And uh, I came a little bit early. Uh, mm -hmm. I was a little bit premature by a couple of weeks. And when my mom called my Indian, Indian aunties to tell them that the baby had been born, um, they said, no, April Fool's, you're joking. <laughs> no way. <laughs> and, uh, and well, I actually was here. And um you know, uh, my parents were uh, slightly unconventional in that my father was Indian and born and raised in India and moved to America when he was in his uh, about 18 years old to attend university. And my mother um, was Canadian, um, first generation, because her father was born in England. And they would have been, um, you know, one of the earlier interracial marriages. Uh, they were married in 1970. And um, so I am uh, a product of, of, of a mixed uh, relationship. And uh, it's something that, you know, I've, I've felt my entire life and in a very, very positive way. And, um, you know, I remember asking my parents when I was quite young, you know, how did my grandparents feel about meeting each of you because of course it's not it wasn't really very traditional or conventional and i thought that perhaps there might have been a little bit of i don't know trepidation on either side and what my mom said to me was that my father's family welcomed her with open arms partly because and he is the eldest son so the motivi but he was holding off on getting married and I think they were quite keen just to see him married and hopefully start producing grandchildren. Um, I'm actually the second child uh, in, in my family. I have an older sister, um, Nisha, who's an engineer. And I'm sure we'll go into detail on, on, on you know, the rest of my family. Um, and and my, my grandparents on, on both sides were absolutely thrilled um, with the marriage and then ultimately uh, with, with uh, the grandchildren. And I was very close to my grandmother on uh, my maternal side. I actually never got to meet my grandfather, my mother's father, because he um, passed away quite young, quite prematurely. And on my father's side, um, my Ba and Bapuji, I was also very close to. Um, even though they lived in Mumbai um, and, and you know they would visit every couple of years, I still felt a strong closeness to them and felt very, very loved by them. And I still, you know, remember my grandfather singing to me. And although my grandmother did not speak um, English 
almost at all. She had a couple of words. I still felt like we were able to communicate. And that's one of those things about family. And, um, you know, I still feel their presence very much in my life today. Um, even though we were separated by large distances, um, that sort of overwhelming feeling of love and family uh, was very much a part of of my young uh, uh, upbringing. And, and hopefully it's something that, you know, I've, I've been able to pass on to my children and and I certainly see it in, with my nieces and nephews. We're a very, very close and tightly knit family. Oh, that's uh, very, very fascinating, Sonali. So uh, born in Montreal, uh, dad came from uh, Mumbai, uh, which is now Mumbai, from Bombay. Bombay. Uh, yeah, grandparents were there. Mom uh, was here originally, uh, family came from England. Um, did you travel to Mumbai frequently when you were growing up or did just the grandparents come in? Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So remember in those days, born in 73, um, traveling was very, very expensive. It's not the way it is. To... So mm -hmm. yes, we did travel to India and my father felt it was very important for us to see India and also meet some of the relatives because I still had cousins and, and aunts and uncles who were in, in uh, Bombay. Felt it was very important for us to to know them and meet them, um, but we only went every couple of years. So the, my first trip to India, I remember it extremely vividly. Um, I was five years old, mm -hmm. um, and and again, those memories are very very strong because you know seeing India for the first time as someone who's grown up in in Canada and Montreal, I mean, talk about culture shock and just you know, India is is, is full of you know, sort of just black and white and 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 the juxtaposition. And I, I, I remember it so, 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 so vividly. Um, but then, you know, and we traveled quite extensively around India for several months when I was five years old. My parents took us out of school to do that. And I remember the school was very, very supportive because they said there's no better education than going back and, and mm -hmm. um, you know, seeing where you're from and, 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 and traveling around India and spending time with relatives. Um, and then we went back um, again when I was 14 years old um, as a family. Um, I then traveled to India a couple of times on business um, when I was living in London. And then when my father passed away, we went back to India as a family um, as to, to do a memorial for him. But it was also really important for us to, it was the first time that my children and and my sisters and brothers' uh, children saw India. So that was a really, really important trip that we did in 2018. So we returned to India, but not that frequently. And fortunately, my grandparents were well enough and had the means to be able to come to see us every couple of years. So you didn't go as often. I mean, you have vivid memories when you were five, but grandparents uh, would come in um, and visit you. And you said uh, uh, grandmother didn't speak much English. Did you get to learn Gujarati as you were growing up? Well, I can count to 10. I can ask for water. <laughs> I can say hello and goodbye. Um, no, I didn't. And and it, it wasn't for lack of trying. Because language is a, a very important aspect of the bond that people have in many, many ways. And memories yes. also, by the way. That's the reason I'm asking. Yes. And my grandfather was so fluent in English. My Babaji. I mean, he he spoke perfect English. Um, and my father did want us to speak Gujarati. But you have to keep in mind, when you're in a household where only one parent speaks the language, you don't get to hear it. And and we did go, I remember we did Saturday school to try and learn Gujarati, but in the end it, it was, you know, we had lots of other things that we were doing too, sport and, you know, wanting to hang out with friends. And so it wasn't something that we were able to continue with. And of course, like looking back and anyone who's listening to this now, I, I do regret it. I wish I spoke Gujarati and Hindi. Um, and so you're right, language is super important in terms of communication, but my grandfather was always there when my grandmother was visiting, not to mention my dad. So he would translate and, you know, my grandmother would just be there with us 
in the room when we would be, you know, telling stories. And, you know, I even remember she used to come and do bedtimes with us, even though she didn't speak English. And and again, I felt very, very loved uh, by her. And I respected her so much because she she was married at a very young age. I think it was 15. My grandfather was a lot older than her. Um, they had a great marriage, um, but, you know, she had many, many children. Um, and she also lost children and lost children at, you know, older stages, like, you know, losing a baby, losing any child is very, very hard. But she, I remember she lost children when they were, 16 and 18 and just what she what she went through um I had so much respect for her she she was an amazing woman and I actually wish um of course that I could have spoken to her more and 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 known the language but it didn't change the fact that she had a significant influence on me and that she was very much a part of um you know my tie to India and my tie to my Indian relatives and 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 you know just someone who who I still think about a lot today. What what do you think inspired you about her? Is it that her resilience, her character? What is it that she's still positive despite uh, you know such such serious losses as there's no bigger loss than losing a child ever. There's no bigger loss, and um, yeah. So I, I I think it's all of those things. It's um you know. She was unbelievably resilient and um, unbelievably strong. And, you know, she kept the family together. And my grandfather was a very hard worker, um, you know, very, uh, I mean, he had several careers, but he had lots of passion projects as well. And he was a pilot. Um, and actually, um, little little known fact, you know, or, or a piece of trivia, he was the first Indian to um, ever build and fly a plane. Um, I mean, he did this with a subscription to Popular Mechanics magazine and, you know, finding parts, you know, talk about necessity as the mother of invention. I mean, he just... You know, it's incredible what he achieved. And and then he flew for the Maharaja. He was part of the RAF. But my grandmother, you know, was there running the household and running the household with, at, at times, you know, 12, 13 children. And I remember asking, like, how did you do that with so many kids? And the answer was, of course, there was this enormous family of many, many children. But she she delegated, you know, there was a daughter who would look after these three much younger children and then another daughter who would look after and then a son who would, and, and, and it's amazing. She, you know, she, she found a way to really make it work. And all of the children in that family, you know, are highly educated, you know, they, 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 they went on to achieve so much. And that was, I think in many ways down to her influence and, you know, how much she, how much she was selfless as well. She invested so much of herself into her children and into her family. And again, against, you know, when I look at how I've been brought up and I've been allowed to be in fact, a little bit selfish and, you know, she didn't have that luxury. So I respect that so much. And, you know, any time that I sort of have a setback or feel like life isn't going my way, I think about what she had to deal with. And I don't spend too much time feeling sorry for myself. And I get right back on the, uh, uh, you know, whatever it is I'm working on, because, um, you know, she's she's someone who is a role model to me. Now, she didn't have a career in the sense or in the way that I, that I, I do. But she had a very strong self, sense of self and sense of what was important and, you know, values that were, um, you know, very, very clearly set. So Ba was a big influence for you. Uh, would you say that? Uh, so, oh, yeah. absolutely. And Bapuji, both. 
and and you know i love them dearly and uh oh. i think you know sometimes when when i have great milestones in my life i think oh i would love to be able to share them uh with ban bapuji well um tell us about dan a little bit what did he do i mean he came as a student when he was 18 or so got married early uh what was his occupation uh in montreal he came as a student when he was 18 he did not get married early he, uh, oh, he i think he might have been a bit of a man about town you know um, uh oh <laughs> there might, I, i'm sure there were a few uh, a few women before my mom but she she would know that um i think he was a, a bit of a ladies man he was very very handsome and very charismatic and although he was an engineer and probably among the top 5 smartest people i've ever met in my life i mean he had a beautiful huge brain and ability to um process and you know understand things and he he, he was unbelievable um but he was also you know very very sentimental and very very loving and caring and it was so clear that family came first above all else and you know having that kind of father means that you can go out and take risks because you always have this you know huge safety net to be able to go out and pursue things and 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 he you know he always gave me great advice as well he was he was a friend and a mentor and a therapist at times i know my sister would say he was a great therapist um but he was he was unbelievably intelligent and hard working um i think a lot of my work ethic came from him and he came over when he was 18 and i mean he worked all kinds of jobs um because he came over with you know virtually nothing in his pockets um you know uh and and immediately you know um got a first job at the YMCA um he also did you know quite a few uh jobs sort of as lab you know manual labor and then finally he got a bit of a dream job in the form of a a draftsman where he was actually using some of his training and and this was all whilst he was going going to school um he went to the university of west virginia on on a scholarship and studied engineering um and he was an engin- a, a mining engineer that's what his degree was in and then he later worked for uh various engineering firms and then when he was about just under 40 years old um he started his own engineering firm and was very successful and actually my brother still works in that company today um my father's unfortunately no longer with us but but my my brother still um you know is is very much uh taking that business forward and um you know my dad was someone who i i was told he originally wanted sons and he ended up with three daughters in a row and then son much much later on but if he if he did want sons i didn't i didn't know it or feel it um you know i i grew up for the first 10 years of my life just with my two sisters i have a sister who's 18 months older than me and a sister who's two years younger than me and then again my my brother came 10 years later but my dad was someone who just really encouraged us to go out and be our best selves and to not limit ourselves and i remember you know little girls play house and play teacher and play school and i remember my dad used to say you know oh, what are you know what are you playing or what are you what, what are you working on and we'd say oh you know i'm uh the teacher and my sister's the student or i'm the nurse and this is the patient and my dad would say you know teachers are great but you know you can be a professor and a professor of anything and nurses are wonderful but why don't you be the doctor and you know um be the astronaut be the pilot be the and and i feel like in our household there was almost no kind of awareness of like my gender holding me or us back in any way and i know that that still holds young girls back today and this is you know i'm 50 so going back 50 years 
I feel like my father was such a forward thinker. And, and I know many, um, you know, th there's sort of Indian households are very well known for being very focused on, you know, having a profession and valuing education highly, which he absolutely did. But, you know, there are also traditional aspects to Indian households, which I feel he didn't um, uh, really hold to, or he didn't, he didn't expect us to um, be limited by. And, and I love that. And, you know, when you're young, you don't, you don't necessarily know when your parents are sort of stepping out of what is traditional because you only know what you know. And when I look back now, I just think, wow, my parents, both of them, they were trailblazers. And I think it's just allowed me to be this person to who, who kind of grabs life and grabs opportunities and 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 doesn't hold back and 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 self-belief as well. And I think that's really important. And and I think my father was so important in instilling that in in myself and and my sisters and my brother. And, you know, I again I'm so grateful to him for that. And I I think about my father every single day. Uh he passed away in 2016. I so wish I could tell him about my career now. Um he would he would be so proud, I know. And of course he's looking down, but um you know, he was he was a huge influence on on me and uh and and again a mentor and um just a a, a wonderful wonderful person to, you know, have on your side and 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 be backing you and be your cheerleader. So very forward thinking. Uh, he had your back um, and encouraging you uh, constantly. Um, and looking down, he probably is very, very proud of uh, what you have accomplished. Uh, so Ali, how about uh, mom? Yeah, so my mom is, um, so grew up in Canada, but mm -hmm. grew up in a very small little town. Um, called Elora, Elora, Ontario. Um, and, you know, so very different, again, from the way I grew up in Montreal, you know, very cosmopolitan, large city. Of course, there's the whole French uh, influence. So she grew up in a very different um, environment. And um, her parents, and I, I was very close to my grandmother, maternal grandmother, my nana, um, oh. Her father had a stroke when he was really young in his 30s, mm. and it was extremely debilitating. And um, he lost, you know, the the use of an entire so side of his body. He pretty much lost the ability to to speak clearly. You know, he had to speak in a very slurred um, uh, voice. And um, although my parents, uh, my, my grandparents were very, very loving, and very very supportive. It, money was tight around their household, and they had to, you know, uh, be very economical um, about, you know, the way they they did things. And and again, you know, I I was very fortunate in in comparison. But one thing I would say is that um, my my mom also had an aunt and uncle who I knew well, uh, Aunt Bessie and Uncle Chris. And um, they were very, very involved also in raising my mom and they weren't able to have children. And fortunately, they were able to provide my mom with lots of enrichment and opportunities that her parents might not have been able to provide her. Um, and so, you know, lots of uh, trips and um, exposure to books and and ultimately helping uh for her to pay to go to university. And my mom is also extremely intelligent in a different way from my dad. Uh, but just to give you an idea, and they would never do this today, but she skipped three grades. She skipped three grades. I mean, she looks back and she thinks, oh my gosh, how could they have done that to me? Because I was a little girl and here I was. But she is... I don't know if you know Matilda, Roald Dahl, M Matilda, you know, the little girl who just reads and reads and reads. My mother is like a living Matilda. 
And when she was a little girl, um, I think by the time she was 10, she had read every single book in her local library. The library was only open three days a week. She always says to me, oh, she wishes it was open five or seven days a week. And she would queue up. She'd be right at the door as soon as the librarian got there with whatever new books had come from Toronto. And she wanted to read them. And she is still an avid, avid reader. I think, you know, reading 30 books a month would not be unusual. So she is unbelievably read. And that gives her all sorts of perspectives on, you know, a wide, wide range of subjects. And and also, I would say she's a very, both of my parents, I would say, were very, like, open-minded, liberal thinkers. And that certainly was passed down uh, to the children. I think part of that is having been so well-read. Um, and and the other thing I will say about my mom, and, and she's incredibly supportive and loving and an amazing mom, um, she... She also is, you know, a really, really great friend and, um, you know, sister and sister-in-law to my father's uh, sisters and brothers. And she's the one that everybody calls. She's sort of the agony aunt. And she's the best advice on earth. Um, you know, anytime even I have a friend who has a problem, I always say, let's get my mom on the phone. She'll figure this out. Let's think that. Um, and, and so she, she's, she's a wonderful, wonderful human being. Um, I wish I could be more like her. Um, and she had a career as a social worker. Um, and in, in Quebec, uh, when you're a social worker, you work for the government. Um, and I think she was very, very successful in that. Um, she did take about 10 years off when my sisters and I were very little because she had us so in such close succession, you know, we're sort of a, a year and a half, two years apart. Um, but she's a, she's a superwoman, um, and she managed to do it all. And she did it all without help and without a cleaning lady and without, you know, all the things that I kind of take for granted today, um, she have, and she did a, a, a miraculous, fabulous job. Super mom, uh, yes. and super dad. So you were really lucky and with amazing grandparents. So was it uh, growing up, uh, going to school in Montreal? How was uh, how was it? Was did you have any challenges? T tell us were there some what were some key inflection points in that journey? Uh, as yeah. you, and was it all in Montreal or did you uh, go to high school somewhere else? Just uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so it was all in Montreal. Um, I went to um, the local preschool and then the local elementary school, not private schools. So these were public schools. Um, and then I went to um, a high school that was just just outside of uh, the town where we lived. I grew up in a, a city called Dorval. Dorval. It's actually where the uh, Montreal International, Trudeau International Airport is in Dorval. And um, so what I would say there is that uh, we, my sisters and I, and, and certainly my older sister and I, uh, we were very, um, very good students. You know, uh, we didn't bring home anything less than an A, apart from, I think, in art. That's the only sub that I didn't get an A in. Yeah. And I remember I used to actually ask a friend of mine to do some of my art projects. I was that bad. Um, but my mom would say that I come by it, honestly, because she's not great at art either. Um, but, you know, we were uh, really, really strong students. And as a result of that, you know, there's a bit of a halo that goes with that. And we were given lots and lots of opportunities um, in school to uh, be enriched and be in kind of uh, streamed in certain subjects. And uh, I loved my elementary school experience. Uh, it was co-ed. Um, I had tons of friends. I, I'm a pretty social person. I, I still am. I get a lot of energy from being around other people. Um, and I was also really active in sport. So um, I was a big soccer player, uh, bigger skater. Um, in the summer, I did synchronized swimming, diving, swim team, and water polo. And then I ran track and field as well, um, and also did cross country running. So I, I, I got very involved. Um, and then later, uh, when I was in high school, I, I trained to be a lifeguard and 
I did that job from the age of 15 to, um, I guess, 20, 21. Yeah. Until I had my first real job, but, but I loved it. And, and that came with, <laughs> with its own social life too, all the lifeguards. And, uh, so I would say it was a pretty bucolic, um, uh, time and period in my life. And, you know, when you ask about challenges, um, you know, the challenges were, how can I, how can I get to the next level or how can I, you know, um, be even better at school? How can I work even harder? How can I, you know, line myself up to have a great job, things like that. So it was, I didn't feel like there were a lot of challenges in terms of certainly I never felt any amount of racism at all. And I was, to be clear, the only Indian uh, kid in my class. And um, I never felt any kind of, I, I never felt treated differently in any way. Um, which it, which is great, and I think that's partly because you know it's Montreal, like super cosmopolitan, um, and and the other thing is I didn't grow up around a lot of other Indian children. Like a lot of my Indian cousins, even the ones who lived in Toronto, they were around a lot of other Indians. Mo most of my exposure to other Indian kids or other Indians, period, was family, you know, my cousins and my aunties and my uncles, um, and grandparents. So um, in that sense, you know, I never felt kind of any any struggle there. And I know others have, so I don't want to uh, diminish that. Um, but but I, I, I never felt it. And if anything, you know, I feel like in some ways it's it's given me a bit of an X factor. Um, certainly like as I got and, and I think my sisters would say this, too, like certainly as I got to high school, you know, it's nice to be a little bit different and you know, exotic and people don't quite know where you're from and, you know, like, oh, maybe there's an interesting story here. And, and, uh, you know, I, if anything, I think it was, it was a nice, uh, advantage. Yeah. So what about high school? How was yes. high school? Yeah. So high school, I, again, went to a public high school, um, was very, very involved in, uh, a number of activities. And by then, you know, I think I knew, um, you know, particularly with, with, with my grades and my uh, interests that I was probably going to want to you know, get into a profession. And I was starting to get, I, I really liked numbers a lot. Um, and, you know, I, I started talking to my dad about being uh, a chartered accountant. And uh, I remember he introduced me to his accountant and, you know, we started having those early conversations about like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, what do you really want to be? And, um, and again, without, you know, he never wanted to, to limit me in any way, but I think he definitely pushed in, in certain other directions. He was an engineer. We have lots of engineers in the family. My older sister was already showing signs that she wanted to go into engineering. Um, but, uh, I, I eschewed that and, and, and stayed very much on the, uh, chartered accountancy, uh, um, train or path. Um, and, you know, high school was, was wonderful in terms of, I had a super active social life. I had a boyfriend, a very serious boyfriend. Um, I remember my Indian aunties used to say studies first, boyfriend second. <laughs> I, I didn't do it in that order, um, but I had, you know, I had this actually a really amazing, kind, supportive, loving uh, boyfriend who I dated for five years from the age of 15 to 20. And I still know him today. Um, he still lives in Montreal, but my parents were really cool with it. Um, you know, the only rule my dad had was like, no boys upstairs, but, you know, we could live with that. Um, but, you know, he even used to come on family holidays with us. Like he was very much a part of the family. And, uh, and, you know, I was really close to my siblings and my siblings were, were, were close to him. And, and by then, you know, my, my brother's 10 years younger than me. And I have almost like a maternal relationship with my brother because it's almost generational, you know, like to the, never had an argument. Um, 
you know, he, I, I love him in the, in the same way I love my sons or my nieces. Um, and, you know, by then my, my brother was, uh, you know, if I was in high school, he was sort of starting to be a real person, you know, talking and hanging out. And, and I remember my brother used to coach his, uh, sorry, my boyfriend used to coach his soccer team. And, you know, we, we were just all very, very close. And it was a really, really happy, happy time. Um, high school. The only thing that I would say in terms of challenges, and this is like me being opening up is, um, my dad definitely drank too much. And, um, when I was in elementary school, I don't think I noticed it in quite the same way, but then when you get to high school, you're much more aware of those things. And, and I remember a couple of times thinking like, Oh, you know, I don't know if I want to have friends over if dad will have had too many beers by that. And that was the only thing I would say um, was a bit of of a challenge for me. And I think my sisters, and it's not like he was uh, like violent or any in any way, but it was just more the unpredictability. And as a high school student, um, you, you know, you you tread a little bit carefully around that. And and we had a great house and a very, like, we had a, a beautiful home. And, like, my house was the place where lots of my friends would come and hang out and sleep over. and Because my parents kind of were really cool about that. Not boys, but, but girlfriends. And, and again, I, I for the first time ever, I was sort of aware of this. And um, and I know that my grandfather, like Babuji, also uh, uh, liked to drink. And I, I, I didn't see that as much because I didn't have as much exposure to him. But I know, uh, I know he did. And was that an issue with mom? Um, no, it, it wasn't an issue, but she was certainly aware of it. Um, because it would have been impossible not to be aware of it. And, you know, she, um, she managed the situation and, and even I did like, you know, if I knew I needed to ask my dad for something, you know, there was a right time and place to do it. And it probably wasn't going to be after 7 p.m. And again, he was very like, you know, he would he would still want you to come and sit with him and hang out with him. And but it was, you know, alcohol changes people. It does. Yeah. Uh, what about college? What how did you decide uh, where to go? what to do. Tell us uh, a little bit about that. Yeah. So college, I went to McGill University. So I stayed in Montreal. I, I clearly, you know, loved Montreal. Um, and, and it's, it's a pretty, pretty amazing place to go to college because it's a campus right in the heart of downtown Montreal. And uh, Montreal has a fabulous nightlife, great party scene, a great cultural scene. I think we were the original foodie city. I'm just going to say it Shout out to Montreal. Um, and again, I think it's because it's this multicultural place. Um, so, so many different cuisines that converge. Um, and so, so McGill was an easy choice for me. Um, and I, I got in, we don't really have the concept of early decision um, in Canada, the way you do in the United States. But I, I got in on this. It was almost like, extraordinarily early decision they wrote to me and said we want you take this letter to the administration building we'll even let you choose your courses ahead of everyone else like we just want your acceptance yeah and uh and I remember receiving that letter and being so excited to share it with my parents and my older sister and oh I don't want to make her feel bad but she didn't get into McGill and yeah, I know. Sorry, Nisha. Uh, she went to um, uh, Ecole Polytechnique, which is the engineering school, Université de Montréal, which is a great school. But I think because of that, um, it, it felt that much more um, exciting. And, and, you know, I guess part of, my parents felt this too, but like part of us thought, oh, well, if Nisha didn't get in and she's such an amazing student, like let's, let's, let's hope someone gets in. And and I got in on this like very very early acceptance, and I didn't I, I I didn't even know that those letters existed, and 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 here I received it, and 
And so I, I went to school um, in the faculty of management. Uh, it's a bachelor of commerce degree that you get out of it, um, uh, that you graduate with. And, and again, I, I loved finance. I loved accounting. Um, I loved strategy. Um, you know, all the courses, all the things that I loved, I was able to really go deep on at, at McGill. And the three years flew by. I had such a blast there. Um, I hope my younger son goes to McGill. My older son's going to go to Boston College, but um, in the fall. Uh, but I had a great experience there. Um, my younger sister ended up going to McGill as well, and we were there together, which was amazing. Yeah, and uh, we had a lot of uh, friends in common. Um, I also had a very serious boyfriend at McGill um, <laughs> for, yeah, probably five or so years. Um, and actually, he was he was Jewish, and um, not not terribly religious Jewish, like he wasn't. Um, but but he was Jewish, and and I actually at that point, you know, our relationship was so serious, um, and we were talking about maybe getting married, and I considered converting, and it's something I absolutely would have done. I I, I would have done that, um, because I'm not a terribly religious person. And uh, religion hasn't been a big part of our our lives. And uh, both of my parents, I would say, were agnostic atheist. And I think that kind of ends up transcending. Um, like we're big b believers in traditions and and values, and you know, but we kind of take the various things that we love from the world's religions and put them together into our own. And um, but anyway, so I dated a great guy. Still in touch with him. <laughs> He's also a chief financial officer of a public company. <laughs> um, and we we pushed each other. Like, you know, uh, we were competitive with, with each other at school. Um, and, and I was very close to his family. Um, I love them. I still love them today. But they were so kind and warm and treated me like their daughter. And it was a really special time. And you know, it was uh, when I look back on life, I would say those couple of years at McGill were, you know, stand out as potentially the best years of my life. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, McGill came to an end. How did you, uh, what was the decision in terms of jobs or future? Were there any decisions uh, there, Sonali? Yeah. So McGill came to an end. And I decided I wanted to go down the chartered accountancy designation, which in Quebec means you have to do two more years of uh, studies um, to get the designation. But you do it at the same time as Articlean with a uh, accounting firm. And I, um, while I was at McGill, I, uh, I was one of the executives on the accounting club. <laughs> um, that, that's how exciting I was. Um, and uh, I managed to get a great summer internship at Pricewaterhouse. Um, and again, these were really competitive internships because Montreal, you know, it's a big city, but it's not like Toronto or New York or San Francisco. So there were five jobs available, five intern jobs available at Pricewaterhouse. And I knew Pricewaterhouse was the one I wanted. And it was the one that my, my dad and I were really leaning into. And I got to know... Um, the head of recruitment there really well as part of my accounting club. Uh, dude. Uh, I remember her name was Lynn Sachs. She was fabulous. And, um, you know, I, I got one of these really uh, exclusive internships. And then the great thing about that was at the end of the summer, they make you an offer for full time. So when you go back to your last year of college, of, of university, you know you're going to be going into a full time job. So you can be a bit more relaxed and laid back. And um, so I studied and worked for two years after I did my undergrad and then uh, got my chartered accountancy designation. And at that time, I um, in Canada, you write what's called the uniform final exam to become a chartered accountant. It's a really tough exam. It's 50% pass rate. Um, and I ranked in the country. Uh, yes. And that was, that was a big moment because it, what it meant was a lot of employers started reaching out to me again, getting letters, you know, oh, and, and, you know, your pictures in the newspaper and, 
it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of pomp and circumstance that goes with it. And um, at that time, I decided I probably didn't want to stay in a county. And um, I uh, moved at that point, you know, packed up my bags and I moved to London, England, to the UK, where, of course, my my grandfather was born. So I was able to get a visa. Um, and uh, I moved when I was uh 24 years old. So I left Montreal for the first time um, and, uh, you know, packed my bags and moved to London. And I didn't really know anybody in London. And uh, and that's when I started my career in, um, it's called the city, but basically Wall Street. And I took a job at Lehman Brothers and changed careers and uh, became uh, an equity analyst uh, covering telecommunication stocks. And it was a really exciting time in the market um, because there was a lot going on in Europe and all of the telecom companies, which were these huge um, cash flow machines, they were privatizing. So they had been owned by the governments and they were privatizing for the first time. So there was just a ton of really interesting work to do. Um, and at the time that I moved to London, I remember my parents, my dad especially really didn't want me to go. And I think now that I'm a parent, I see, you know, these sort of um, milestones in your children's lives. And I think he probably knew then, okay, if she's leaving Montreal, she might never come back. And I remember saying, like, I'm just going for two years. I'm just going to go and travel and have fun and see the world. But I'm coming back. Montreal is my home. And uh, he was right to worry a little because I never did come back. And at the time, the plan was, you know, I would do an MBA. You know, again, this was planned with my parents. You know, you'll go do an Ivy League MBA. Um, you've got the grades. You've got the work experience. You've got, like, you know, go do your two years in London and then start applying to Harvard and Wh Wharton and, uh, you know, Stanford. And those two years went by. and. Um, I remember calling my parents and saying, I have Harvard and Wharton MBAs working for me because I spent the last three years, you know, in, 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 in London, well, a, a year in Montreal and then two years in London on Wall Street and working on really big deals. And then, you know, people who are graduating from MBA, they haven't had that experience. So I said, it was not the right time for me to stop on this, you know, great um, career trajectory I'm on. And I did love my work. And, and so I stayed in London and, uh, that's actually where my, my children were born and, and raised, uh, for the first 12 and 14 years of their lives. Wow. Wow. What an incredible journey. Um, so Nali, when you look back, uh, I think I know, but can you pick, uh, one or two or three just briefly inflection points that were, you know, kind of determining, I mean, you are right now CFO for successful software company. You had a 20 year career in wall street and you sit on boards, you were in a key role at HP, but what were some of the inflection points moving to London? Was that one, an That's inflection point? Huge inflection point. Absolutely. And it was one of these kind of sliding doors moments where again, I was in a, very serious relationship with somebody. Um, but I think he had a view in terms of what our lives were going, you know, the path that we were on. And I realized I wanted something different. And, you know, actually one of my Achilles, I think a little bit is that I'm a people pleaser, which my mom always says to me, when you're a people pleaser, you please everybody but yourself. And, and uh, yes. So, at that point, I realized, you know, that's actually not what I want. And um, it was a really hard thing to do. Um, but, you know, I, I, I moved to London and, and, and again, like started this very different career. And, and the opportunity set in London was so much wider than, than what was available to me in, in Montreal at the time. Partly because, you know, Montreal was going through a difficult political um, uh, backdrop with the uh, French-English-Quebec separation. And, 
it felt at the time very much like English was not the language of, uh, of advancement. Now, I am bilingual. I went to school, to elementary school in French. Um, but still, it, it, it just didn't feel like it was going to be uh, a place where I would flourish. And and I was really career driven. I knew I wanted to accomplish things career wise. And London felt like, you know, I remember going to interview at London in, in London and I had so many job offers and same couldn't be said in Montreal. You know, I felt like I was much more limited. So, you know, I spread the proverbial wings and, 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 and moved to London. That was definitely a, 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 a tipping point or inflection point. And, you know, when I look back, of course it was the right thing to do. Um, because I ended up with this career that I love so much and opportunities that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. But I had to, you know, it wasn't easy, like landing in London, not knowing a soul. Um, I remember, you know, looking for, and, and the exchange rate, the, the Canadian dollar to the British pound was 2.7 to one at the time. So I, I felt pretty poor. Um, and I remember when we were trying to find our first flat. So my my boyfriend who later became my husband was with me and we we couldn't believe the down payment you had to put to get the flat and we were thinking like how are we ever going to raise enough money to even have a flat and we were doing it from pay phones and you had to pay to make local calls and i remember like putting in more and more coins and it was pouring outside and you know nothing was online back then so we had this thing called the loot where we were looking for apartments but I mean, it's it's those experiences that kind of make you who you are, right? And 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 it's sort of the the hardship. You know, when you talk about challenges and 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 you asked about challenges, like I remember that feeling very challenging. And I remember some of the people that I met when I first got to London were saying to me, you know, London can be a lonely place. Like, be sure that you're ready for this. Um, and you know, it was it 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 was great, and and London is such a special city, and like London still in so many ways feels like my home. I spent twenty twenty plus years there, and my kids were born and raised there, so I think that also makes it feel very much like home. But that was certainly an inflection point that move, and again, it wasn't it wasn't super smooth. You know, it was hard. It was one of the hardest things I've done, but yet I see it as a positive inflection point. Um, I think. Another um, inflection point for me was when I came, so I worked at Goldman Sachs for about eight years. Um, and it's actually where I was when I had uh, my two children. And I remember coming back from my second maternity leave and it was post the global financial crisis. Again, you know, a, a difficult, challenging time. And I remember coming back and a lot of the management had changed and a lot of the the mentors who had hired me into the business were gone. And I I realized, you know, it wasn't, I, I didn't feel comfortable there in the way I did for, you know, the the previous seven years. And I decided to to move jobs and I went to Barclays Capital and and went to go join um one of my great mentors. His name is Howard Spooner, but he had a huge influence on my career and 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 invested a lot in me. Um and, you know, again, it was about going after where I felt the opportunity was. And it would have been easy to stay at Goldman Sachs. I was actually being promoted. I was running a very, very large team. But I felt like I might have been limiting myself there, given some of the other changes. And and I, I and I moved um, and, and changed jobs. And again, every time you change jobs, it's, you know, you're you're reinventing yourself to a certain extent. Um, but, but it's, it's worthwhile because, you know, all the, the upside that then comes with it. And then I would say, you know, the final, um, inflection point was when I decided to leave the UK and we decided as a family to leave the UK to go and, um, pursue an operating role, um, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise and to go and, uh, join a former mentor of mine who was the chief financial officer of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And, um, and you know, again, that was a huge move, you know, going from London, England to Silicon Valley, going from working, you know, spending 20 years in investment banking to 
becoming an operator. Um, but it was it was such a great move. So I would say, like, w- when I look back and as I reflect, you know, they were really hard, those things, but they were absolutely the right thing to do. And uh, so I think, you know, there's there's a lesson in that for everyone. And what is the lesson for our listeners? Um, yeah. Because change, as you said, is hard. And you don't know what's at the end of that change. So what uh, what would you tell the people who are listening to Sonali and CFO of Ring Central? Yeah, and... I would say... Oh, sorry. No, yeah. please go ahead. I would say, you know, don't be afraid to put yourself outside of your comfort zone. Because typically when you do that, you open up optionality. Um, it's the opposite of restricting yourself and, you know, you widen your aperture. So um, it's, it's obviously easier to stay in what you're doing. Um, and, you know, rinse, wash, repeat can get really comfortable, but I'm going to say, push yourself to be uncomfortable. And, and I still challenge myself to do that now and today and in my, in my job as well. So push yourself to be uncomfortable. I think that's a great message. Uh, Sonali, you mentioned a couple of mentors along the way. Uh, Every guest comes here and talks about the role of mentors. Can you briefly tell our guests, how do you go about identifying mentors and how valuable are they? Whether it's, you know, mentors come in many shapes and sizes. You talked about the role of your dad. You talked about the role of your mother. You talked about Ba. But just very briefly uh, for our listeners listening to you, uh, what are mentors? What do mentors mean to you? Yeah, so I I am a collector of mentors. I I I love having mentors in in various aspects of my life, um, not just professional, even personal. Um, and and as you say, they come in all you know various shapes and sizes. I typically. Um, like to choose a mentor that's not necessarily exactly in my industry or in my wheelhouse or swim lane, because I think an external perspective can be so valuable. And I'm always afraid of that kind of echo chamber um, or the emperor has no clothes. And I've seen that (laughs) in many instances. Um, So I think really important to, um, Again, have that outside in perspective. Um, and 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 don't go and look for a mentor that's a carbon copy of you, you know. And and again, I think that's sometimes the temptation. And so, you know, I, I would say push yourself to to not go where it's easy. Um, and I'm actually very um calculated and prescriptive about choosing mentors. And um I hope that doesn't sound disingenuous, but like I literally will have a target list of, I would really like to get this person's perspective and who do I know that might be able to introduce me to that person? And so I'm actually fairly prescriptive about it. And then of course there's, there's people in your career who you come across, who you really admire and you observe and you think I would like to learn and 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 be able to be a lot more like that person. And there are certain character traits. And, um, you know, it usually tends to be areas where I see somebody excel and I don't have that superpower, but I'd really like to uh, cultivate it. And 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 that's another thing I do. And 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 I I do a, a lot of observation of executives and observation of people and in various uh and, and observation and reflection. And then I think, yeah, that's where I need bulking up or that's where I need um, to push myself. And, uh, you know, I've been really lucky with mentors. I um, I had a fabulous mentor at Lehman Brothers. Um, her name is Karen Egan. Um, she is still one of my best friends in the universe. We're actually godmother to each other's uh, children, but she hired me into Lehman Brothers. And she 
was amazing in terms of empowering me uh, to do things. And and really, it wasn't even just delegation. It was, you know, she allowed me to take risks and take on big pieces of work um, and, and sort of showed me that, you know, I could do it. And, and I've taken... I've taken a lot away from that. And that's how I manage my people um, and my teams. And and I know when I get 360 feedback, teams and 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 uh, you know, people I work with really appreciate that. So she gave me these opportunities to to stretch myself. Um, so she was a really important mentor. And then I had, you know, Howard Spooner um when I was at Goldman Sachs. Again, incredibly uh 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 um resilient person, but also he came from a very different part of the business from me, but he helped me make better decisions. And he helped me a lot with my professional judgment and trusting my judgment. And he taught me how to um, get conviction around something and a lot of my ability to influence, because that is such an important skill as a as an executive, that ability to influence that's important as an operator. That's an important as a board member. That's important as, you know, a team member, a peer. And and he was extremely, um, you know, uh, helpful in 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 cultivating those skills in me. Um, and then you know, since I've moved to the valley, I have a handful of of fabulous mentors. And I remember when I first got to the valley, someone said to me, um, you know, you'll always be treated like an outsider here. And I remember being a little bit, you know, taken aback. And I will tell you, I do not feel like an outsider here. I feel totally ingrained in this community, a community that I love, by the way. I absolutely love and feel like it is such a privilege to be part of this ecosystem here. And I think it was great mentors that have allowed me to feel the way I do, so at home here. So um, it's, uh, mentors have played a huge and important role in my life. And I also uh, feel it's an honor and a privilege when somebody asks me to mentor them. And I am both formal and informal mentor to to several uh, people. It tends to be more women and and but, you know, men or women, I, I, I find it a privilege and, and, you know, a part of my role and kind of where I where I'm at in life, where I can really give back in many ways. So uh, I think the message for our uh, folks, if I may summarize is, find somebody who's not a carbon copy of you. You are actually pretty strategic in terms of looking for mentors, uh, you know, uh, identifying skills that maybe you admire or you want to grow into. Um, so I think those are excellent points and they, you know, these mentors play an incredible role. Um, Sonali, uh, at the end, uh, and we, I could, you know, like I said, go on, uh, but we generally like to ask some quick lightning round questions, very brief ones. Um, if you were to, uh, you know, give us, we ask this to all our guests, your definition of Indianness, what would that be? Oh, um, so for me, Indianness is really about the values. Um, and I'm going to go back to where we started, you know, strong sense of family, mm -hmm. um, desire to give back, um, providing guidance, support, and love, and, you know, being proud of who you are. And in my case, being proud of being different from a lot of the people that I grew up with. Values, being proud of who you are and being proud of being different. So I'm going to ask you a little tough question. One person, one person who really you think has been the most influential person in your journey. One. I mean, I have some guesses, but let's see if you surprise us. One. My dad, my dad. I thought so. I, I love you, mom. <laughs> I love so many of you, but my dad, no question. And I hope he is uh, listening and he's watching and be very, very proud. 
Um, Sonali, uh, Nike's tagline is just do it. What is Sonali's uh, tagline? Oh, this is a tougher one. My yeah. timeline. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Well, that's a pretty good one. I'm going to just ask you one question, and I don't know if if you are not doing this line, I'm just curious because of the feeling that I got. If you are not the finance accounting, the chartered accountant, have you thought if there was a parallel path in your life, what would have been an interesting career choice for you? Yeah, so I do think that I might have won. So parallel life. And and you know mm -hmm. what? It's never too late, right? It's it never is too late. Um, I think doing something more entrepreneurial. Something you more know, having my own Having my own business. And well, that's something I think is, that's in your future. So, but is there anything that you say, could have, should have, would have. Oh, honestly, I I find regret is not very helpful. Okay, good. And yeah, and what I will say is, I feel extremely, extremely happy and satisfied with my life. I, I, and 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 I feel like there were so many people who we talked about today who played a huge role in. Mm -hmm. you know, helping me become the person I am today. So, no, I'm not going to talk about regrets. Okay, actually, one regret, maybe. Mm -hmm. I. It's never the right time to have a baby, right? And I had two sons. And I think maybe when I look back, um, having one more child. But, you know, I love my sons and they're perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, this has been Fabulous, Sonali. Thank you for firstly opening yourself up and giving us a window to some amazing people, your ba, your grandparents, um, your dad, your mom. Uh, I almost feel like I know them all. So thank you. And what a great career journey. And I have a feeling this is just the first chapter of many chapters to come. And we really hope that we have you back. So thanks again for inspiring, for being who you are. Thank you so much, Sanjay, for letting me tell my story. It's been awesome, and it's, uh, it'll inspire a lot of people, so thank you.